Thanks, Liz Felipe. Let's have two more minutes. I'm just trying to reach uh, Mahmoud and check that he's connected. Okay. Checking, you can still see me. I hid my self view, so I can't see myself. Like, I don't like to see myself, but I know Webex less, so yes. I just wanted to make sure you. I'm still with you. Yeah, we can see you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for checking. Uh, welcome, Mahmoud. Thanks so much for joining. Perfect timing. You are muted. Just let's check if we can hear you. So I couldn't hear you. And I'm muted. Perfect. Professor Dudu, oh. how are you? Minister Mashat and my good friend. How are you, Mahmoud? Good Hello. to see you. Hello, everybody. All right. So let's do something useful here. Okay. Ready when you are. Over to you, Luis Felipe. Should we start? Okay. Excellent. Okay, welcome, uh, welcome everybody. This is a, uh, part of a series of conversations uh, on on the path towards uh, the COP twenty seven uh, in Egypt. My name is Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. I am the global director for poverty and equity at the World Bank. Uh, greetings from the Washington D.C. headquarters of the World Bank. We have a very important uh, uh, conversation today. I'm very interested. That has prompted a lot of uh, interest in the in the social media. We expect the high high attendance. Uh, we are honored to have uh, uh, Professor Esther Duflo, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics. I will uh, explain, uh, talk a bit more about her current position and so on. But this will be a conversation between her and uh, after her presentation, we will have a, a, an exchange with Mr. Mahmoud Mohildin, uh, who is uh, not only the UN Climate Change High Level Champion for Egypt, but also the UN Special Envoy for LDG Finance. But uh, we're also privileged to have today um, uh, Her Excellency uh, Rania Al-Mashat, uh, Minister uh, of International Cooperation from the Arab, Arab Republic of Egypt, and also uh, a very good economist that has a long trajectory uh, in the area of monetary policy, central banking, and so on. So I will start by giving the floor to uh, uh, the minister for opening remarks and also being Egypt, the host of the COP, of the COP27. It's really good to have you here, minister. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And it's uh, such an honor uh, uh, to be uh, you know, starting with the series uh, of lectures that the World Bank uh, is putting together. Uh, on the road uh, to COP27, uh, and a particular pleasure and honor to be with uh, uh, Professor uh, Duflo, given uh, uh, not just uh, uh, the Nobel Prize, but the, the seminal work that she has done uh, to try and have evidence-based uh, movements when we talked about poverty and inequality. And there's no better uh, subject than climate change that really affects uh, people globally. Uh, COP27 is in Sharm el Sheikh, it is in Africa. Uh, this is uh, a time where we are trying to move from pledges to implementation, uh, trying to make sure uh, that uh, the development trajectory and the climate trajectory come hand in hand. They are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and therefore, when developed countries uh, are thinking about their commitments and making uh, uh, them on the ground, uh, it is very important to see how that uh, can be done uh, and affects people. If I just go uh, to uh, what Professor Duflo has been uh, doing with randomized uh, control trials and how uh, the uh, poverty uh, and equality uh, have been coming uh, uh, in a very um, a scientific way uh, and have actually uh, guided policy 
uh, this is something that uh, also is much needed in the climate uh, in the climate space. Uh, just looking a little bit uh, and reading about uh, uh, what you have been uh, calling for when it comes to uh, uh, climate action. Uh, again, uh, this concept that there is a gap between engineering estimates when we talk about technology and mitigation and actually reality on the ground. These are uh, messages that we need to hear more uh, about, messages that need to make their way uh, in the mainstream when it comes to countries sitting together around the negotiating table to basically see the impact uh, of uh, how uh, climate commitments can actually uh, affect uh, uh, affect people. And let me just conclude by saying that uh, the uh, agenda on climate uh, is uh, one that is very, very uh, important uh, in different countries. Uh, but again, as the work uh, has shown at MIT at the center, uh, that uh, there is a gender aspect, uh, there is uh, a, a poverty aspect, uh, there's an education aspect. That's the same with climate as well. Uh, each one uh, of those uh, items uh, are directly linked to what countries need to do when it comes uh, to their climate agenda. Uh, and therefore, uh, the uh, looking at uh, the scientific way of uh, 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 designing uh, policies for countries and interventions uh, when it comes to the climate space is extremely important to ensure that we don't have uh, more increase in poverty. And unfortunately, what we're seeing, uh, and it has been documented, that many of the hard-won uh, gains uh, on uh, equality uh, have actually been uh, uh, unfortunately erased uh, with the recent uh, uh, both war as well as uh, uh, the climate uh, situation uh, that we are seeing uh, globally. So uh, we are all here to listen uh, to Professor uh, Duflo, and we're very happy that uh, in this inaugural uh, series, uh, we are starting with you. Uh, all the uh, uh, scientific and evidence-based work on poverty and equality become extremely more important today as we're talking about the climate agenda. Thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, hearing in and listening to your interventions. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. As you said, this is the uh, beginning of a series of uh, talks on the road to COP27, and uh, it is a privilege to have a Professor to flow with us. I will just mention a uh, few uh, elements as uh, also an introduction uh, here in the bank, in the poverty and equity practice, we have as our mandate, or one of our mandates is to bring also this conceptual clarity in, in terms of the links between climate action, uh, poverty reduction, uh, and inequality. Uh, there are many aspects that to mention. I will mention three that are particularly relevant. One is the very well-established fact that the effect of climate change uh, in terms of, of the dynamics of, of, uh, the, of nature has been affecting disproportionately, not only poor countries, but also poor people within countries. So the effect of, of climate change has, been, uh, has had a regressive impact, uh, and we have to uh, deal with that by responding uh, with specific policies and to building more resilience Second point is more forward looking and is the idea of how we can identify complementarities and trade-offs and how we can turn the climate action into, as, as uh, uh, the certain extern mentioned at some point, the, the, the inclusive growth uh, story of the 21st century. Uh, where, are, where are these real opportunities in a place in which we are asking countries to undergo a major structural transformation technological transformation that go from energy transition to very concrete uh, uh, nature-based solutions at the level of communities and their livelihoods. So this is a, a very complex uh, problem. And finally, I will just mention also that it also matters the, 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 the distributional elements of climate, uh, of, of climate change in general also matter for the political economy when we talk about policies that will have to be implemented, um, it's not only about the comparative statics of two points in, in two different scenarios, it's actually the transition uh, towards the, the, the scenario with more inclusiveness and sustainability that involves also political economy constraints. We cannot talk about everything in this session, but we have one of the uh, uh, absolute leading experts uh, that has really taught us a lot about the economics of poverty. Professor 
start the flow. She is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics in the Department of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, she is also the co-founder and co-director of the Ab Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. And I could go on and on uh, in terms of the tra her trajectory. We know her work. She's the founder and leader of the uh, RCT uh, movement in economics profession. She was also awarded two uh, 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 awards that, in a way, are the, the leading indicators of the third one that she got. So she was the, she was awarded the Genius Grant uh, MacArthur Fellowship in 2009 and the John Bates Clark Medal in 2010. And as I said, the leading indicators to what will come later, uh, which is the Nobel Prize in Economics. So, Professor Duflo, thank you very much for uh, you know allowing me to be part of this uh, series and having the inaugural, inaugural uh, uh, talk. So, I will give the floor to you for 20 minutes, uh, and then I will go uh, to our next speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Mahmoud Mohildi. So, Professor Duflo, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Minister. Thank you uh, to the organizer for having me. Thank you for <laughs> organizing this series of talks in the first place. It's very, very, very important that the World Bank uh, takes a leading role in these discussions, and it's particularly nice to see this happening. Uh, uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for being here and for being a champion of uh, the poor in the uh, 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 climate change conversations. Uh, 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 Minister, I'll take the opportunity to also thank Egypt for uh, uh, being the host for our newest uh, office, Jeep uh, uh, Almena, who is now in Cairo and has a successful uh, collaboration with the with the Egyptian government through the Egypt Impact Lab, and we are looking forward to do, do uh, much more together. Uh, I will uh, share a presentation, if you don't mind. Um, and I'll try to do uh, the, to go through the presentation rapidly so that we have uh, we have uh, ample time for conversation. Uh, climate change is uh, a problem on many respects, and one of them is that it's going to be very difficult to convincingly address uh, for the following reason. Set of reasons. The first one is that the emissions responsible for climate change are mainly due to the behavior of rich, rich citizens in the world, and in particular, rich citizens in rich countries. Uh, let me show you some uh, statistics that, that show it. This is uh, work from the World Inequality Report, uh, which shows um, uh, which uses a simple consumption model to show uh, the carbon footprint, to calculate carbon footprint at the individual level within the world, and then shows that the top 10% uh, biggest emitters are responsible for about 50% uh, uh, of the global emission, while the, bo the, the bottom 50% you know, is only responsible for about 10% of the world emissions. So that's what is called the 1050 rule. Another way to put it is to look at uh, the carbon emissions uh, of different of the citizens of each country according to their according to their uh, uh, position in the income distribution where we can see that the richest people contribute a larger share, even within countries. So the inequality within countries is even larger than the inequality uh, across countries. Uh, for example, the top 10% of uh, Americans uh, uh, emit uh, the equivalent of 73 uh, uh, tons of carbon uh, to compare to the top 10% of Europeans who, who only emit 29%. But then the top 1% uh, of Europeans who are not represented on this graph uh, also emit 73 percent of the uh, of tons so this shows that uh, within each region uh, we have that the richer people are the more they emit uh, but then there are also large inequality across regions so even the top 10 percent of, of African emit uh, very little uh, compared to to anybody else uh, and since the uh, so, the, the, so that's the first point, is that it is mainly the rich who are responsible for the emission, and that's related to the fact that it's 
uh, consumption, it's, it's, the emissions are emitted in order to uh, make possible the consumption of the very rich, and the more you reach, the more you consume, in the form of jets and in the form of yacht, but also in the form of various uh, things. The second part, and this was already emphasized, is the cost of, of climate change, on the other hand, are going to be felt mainly uh, in the poorer parts of the world. That's, of course, already true, but that's going to become even truer in the future. That's for two reasons. Uh, the first one is unfortunate, which is the poor countries tend to be in places that are warm to start with. And because the, the impact of, uh, of hot temperature on human health and on productivity is not linear, but increases steeply, in particular above about 100 Fahrenheit or, or 32 degrees centigrade, um, the places that are already hot will suffer, will, will become even hotter. So these places in the next 20 years, uh, the poorer places will add uh, many more days above 32 degrees. You can see that all of Africa will add many more days above 32 degrees, whereas Europe will add uh, almost none. Uh, and even more so by 2050, where uh, places in the north of Latin America or the Sahel region will add a considerable uh, number of very, very hot days. The second reason why uh, poorer countries suffer mo more from uh, uh, climate change and will suffer even more in years to come is that uh, a, a key uh, is that money income is a key a mechanism to adapt to climate change. So, for example, if you live in Texas, uh, a given hot day is not likely to kill you because you are going to be able to spend the day in an air conditioning room. Whereas if you live in India, the same hot day is going to be responsible for more mortality. And we see this on this graph using historical weather pattern uh, to show that a given day above 90 degrees uh, um, Fahrenheit and even more 95 degrees Fahrenheit in India kills very many more people than the same hot day in the US. For these two reasons, when you combine them, uh, if you combine uh, the uh, uh, climate projection at the regional level to the expected effect region by region based on adaptation and, the, and uh, uh, capabilities that vary by regions, you can see that in the next 20 years, mortality cost will be concentrated in places that are already hot, such as Pakistan, where it's already happening in a way, such as the Sahel region uh, or the Horn of Africa. By mid-century, this is going to be even worse with, again, uh, uh, part of MENA, the north of, uh, of, of South Asia and, uh, and, um, and the Sahel region and North Africa to be the most affected. So this makes it for what I've been calling a political problem for hell, which is the people who need to do the most in order to solve this problem are not really going to, are not really the one who are going to suffer most from this problem. They are going to suffer too, but not as much. That means that we need to commit now before the costs have actually been incurred, to all of them, before it's too late, uh, to prevent climate change. Why am I saying we need to act now before uh, we are hurtling into a crisis? Uh, it is in part informed by the, what happened during the COVID-19 crisis. The COVID-19 uh, is a good rehearsal for climate change because it's a global crisis with global consequences uh, where a lot of the levers of actions were actually in the richer countries. And what we've seen is that rich countries were able to rally and spend a large amount of money to protect their own citizens, uh, up to 24% of their GDP, according to the IMF. But despite the economic cost of the pandemic in poor countries, there was in fact very little increase in aid going there. Uh, and as a result, the poorest countries were only able to spend, you know, a single digit fraction of their GDP on fiscal support measure. Second example, the world set up COVAX to help poor countries purchase vaccines, but then the rich country proceeded to hog the vaccines that were available early in the pandemic. So it shows how the political economy in the rich countries makes it very, very difficult uh, to help other, the rest of the world, even when um, it is in the interest, in the obvious interest of the entire planet, and uh, at least when we are facing a crisis, which uh, suggests that we really need to make firm commitments now before the panic sets in. 
And even if the costs are larger in poor countries, which is what I showed, the experience shows us that rich countries will try to self, save themselves first, even if uh, this is less important to save yourself if you live in Germany than if you live in Egypt. So this is where I, I think we need to, 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 to do something, but here's where we are. So a somewhat unfair characterization of where we are, but you guys are all very familiar with this, so you can correct it. In the, goes uh, in some sense in three points. The first one is there is not enough money flowing towards uh, low and middle income countries. The second is that uh, there is a, a heavy reliance on technological solutions to the extent commitments have been made as the hope of uh, uh, taking our way out of this problem, continuing with an intact life, lifestyle, which would be fueled in the carbon uh, neutral uh, way. And the third is a reliance on private commitment in, in, in Glasgow in a large way uh, with ESG uh, investments uh, uh, taking like the, the biggest part of the, or, or at least the dime light. So to insist on uh, not enough money flowing towards the low and middle income countries, first of all, the commitments are too weak. Um, second of all, the one that was made in Paris of 100 billion uh, was not even fulfilled, was not even repeated in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, so there is no commitment for enough money and whatever little money exists, almost none of it is being spent for adaptation in order to help the poorer countries to, to, to face the problems that they are already experiencing and that they are going to experience in a bigger way. Almost all of the money for climate change goes towards technological engineering solutions for mitigation. Why is that? It's because we are obsessed by win-win solution. We are obsessed with the hope that we can basically find some miracle solution out of this problem where we are going to live even better because the energy will become even cheaper uh, than what we have now and we'll be able to live uh, a better, more fair, etc. way if, if we only we use the right technology. Uh, this attraction for win-win is something that I've known all my life. We've always, you know, in, in poverty, there's, there's been, they, they come one after the other, after the other, after the other. When you have a big problem, the hope that it could be solved by one magic bullet is just too strong. And here we have two. We have the technologies that are going to solve, you know, solve the technology do change. It's solar. And then when we realize solar will take a lot of space, it's, uh, um, you know, carbon capture or, or, or whatnot. And then the other part of the win-win is the market, which, you know, where we think that investors will find it in their interest to actually in, invest in climate solution and we can uh, 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 trust the ESG to get it right. What I want to say here, and I've said it in other forms, so I don't want to spend too much time on this point here, but it's very important is that uh, these purely technological solutions that are recommended as solutions, their impact is largely tested in real lives. And there is a huge gap between the engineering estimate and the impact you find in real life when it is in fact implemented. One example is weatherization of homes, which for example in France is like the climate policy that we are able to talk about. In the US, it's been tested very rigorously uh, during the Obama era where uh, there was the subsidies for weatherization of homes. And basically it has no impact on energy consumption. So it is not as effective as believed. It's possibly totally ineffective in terms of changing the, the, the planet. Another example is energy consulting. So we have the idea that uh, there is a lot of low hanging fruits in developing countries that farms could become more energy efficient and therefore grow faster and at the same time uh, be kinder to the planet. Um, Nick Ryan, along with Terry, carried out a randomized evaluation of an energy consulting and financing program in India, where they found that farms did save money, but all of the money that they had, they invested into producing more. So on balance, they actually emitted more at the end of it, which is probably good for the farms, but is not good for the planet. Um, so what needs to happen now at COP27? Let me make two preliminary points. The first one is that we need to, uh, we cannot tackle climate change without tackling redistribution across countries. So all of you know that, but in case you've forgotten, I would just one word, India. Uh, India at the very last minute of the COP26 uh, managed to, you know, to, to get India along with China uh, managed to change 
uh, the commitment for from coal phase out to coal phase down, which is relatively uh, um, um, unspecified. Um, and of course, they were criticized in particular by the smaller uh, island nation and other developing countries for having betrayed them. But one has to see that, you know, rem just remember the graph that I showed you about India. India feels that they need to become rich in order to protect themselves from the impact of climate change. The more there are climate crises in India and the more India needs to be able to afford to its citizen air conditioning and, and so on, they need, to in they need to have access to cheap energy and they will do a lot for that, as we saw, for example, during the, 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 Russian, the, the recent war. They, it is not even, a, a, it, the political calculus makes perfect sense. Uh, the, if you see that nobody is going to help you to adapt, the, ch the, the most effective way for countries who can afford it is to become richer faster and, in the, and to be able to have more energy to protect their citizen against the heat. So it's not just a matter of uh, that you have the right to growth or something like that. It is like there is really no choice if the work is going to, if India is going to become so much hotter to be able to, to install and power air conditioning units that are going to become part of the problem. And that's just an allegory for, for the rest of the situation. The second point, which is important, is we cannot tackle climate change either without tackling or distribution within countries. That's true in rich countries. So, for example, an effort in France to uh, have a carbon tax basically fell on the sword of this uh, huge yellow vest uh, jacket. The guy in this T-shirt is saying the money for climate change is to be found in the fiscal paradise, not in the pocket of the proletariat. That's true in poor countries as well, where uh, effort to to do things, not just for climate, but also for the environment, water protection and so on, uh, often get stopped by uh, by the fact that people do not trust that, for example, if free power to farmers uh, uh, is eliminated, the farmers are going to be su sufficiently compensated. So the, the, the because uh, uh, citizens are extremely worried about uh, the incidence of any climate change measure on their bottom line, uh, without uh, uh, an effort to redistribute that is absolutely explicit and that is trusted, which is a hard part, uh, all the climate change policy is going to falter within each country, poor countries and rich countries. So here's a blueprint for a serious commitment to, to funding that take both of these needs into account. First of all, I want to say that promising again, vaguely something is not going to be sufficient. We need something very specific at COP27. If we could get it, that's more dream than something that I, you know, that that I'm putting out for you is. We need a commitment to a mechanism to raise money to be spent in poor country for climate. So here is one commitment uh, that I would propose that would be investigated, since uh, as we saw, the contribution to the problem is intimately linked to income inequality, in particular to top income inequality in the world. Why not make the solution also tied up to inequality? Uh, in particular, there has been a lot of discussion of international taxation uh, in early 2021, mostly leaving out completely the poor countries. But since this situation of international taxation is on the table, uh, why not think about a minimum taxation of very wealthy individuals and corporations uh, that could be put uh, in a uh, in a fund that would be assigned to a climate that would be exclusively assigned to a climate change adaptation and mitigation for poor countries. Uh, if this is something that we agreed to, at you know we were able to to you know, the countries were able to agree to to a minimum uh, corporate taxation, so it might be possible to agree to something like that. So not just a vague we're going to give you 100 billion if we remember it, but uh, this is how we, it's going to be financed, and that's an example of, of of a way in which it could be it could be financed, which should be politically acceptable. Uh, by citizens of poor countries. Particularly, the searches could be linked to a proper valuation of the social cost of their activities uh, with a proper accounting of social cost of carbon, uh, of a ton of carbon, uh, uh, properly valued to take into account the loss to human life that are related to climate change and so on. Once we have that money, then we need also to have an open-minded approach to find out what works. 
Uh, in climate, like in poverty, there are unfortunately no silver bullets. Uh, the full decarbonization in rich economies will be very difficult and would take a very long time at current level of consumption and current lifestyle. So we need to we need to learn to consume less, and we don't know how to do it. So so that is something that we need to learn. Uh, we still know very little about how poor countries can adapt and mitigate climate change. Um, uh, whether they are, uh, uh, you know, what solutions exist uh, to, to, grow in an to grow in an equitable way and also to protect themselves. And we need to make regulation work better. So we, we have very, you know, very many things we don't know, but we know how to learn. So this, you would not be surprised that this is kind of the approach we are trying to, to take at JPAL in particular uh, within the uh, King Climate Action Initiative. Uh, we are trying to play our role there by generating evidence and catalyze the scale up of uh, a policy solution that are highly effective in these four pillars, uh, mitigation, adaptation, co-pollutants, um, and uh, uh, energy access, uh, because ad energy access is uh, the, the central way to, to adapt. So here's an example of a mitigation project, a payment for environmental services. Um, in in Uganda, an experiment was done where people, farmers, people who had some plots of land were uh, given money for keeping their trees there. And that worked. Uh, tree cover declined by 4% in treatment villages compared to the control without displacement of deforestation onto other land. Uh, it's only uh, 57 cents per ton of carbon delayed. Uh, so the benefit is much, much larger than the cost, even at, at a low valuation. Of, of carbon. Example for co pollutant uh, is some work by Michael Grenstone, Roni Pandey, and others on emission uh, trading schemes. Um, so the firms were basically as a, a market was created for firms to trade their emission uh, of uh, particulate matters. The plant assigned to the emission market reduced emission by 20 to 30 percent. And this project is now uh, adapted and scaled up in Gujarat and, and Punjab producing a template, not just for uh, air pollution, but also for thinking about how to 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 do something similar for for carbon emissions. For adaptation, an example is rainwater harvesting uh, in uh, 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 in the Sahel. Um, it is a very uh, it is a technology that is uh, that needs to be learned uh, um, uh, in this experiment. Uh, farmers were trained. Uh, training alone uh, resulted in 95% take up that was sustained for three years, showing that some technology can spread by by, by training. It takes money and it's uh, and it, but it's effective, uh, allowing to reput uh, 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 land in cultivation that had been abandoned uh, before. So, in conclusion, the, the COP27 in Egypt is a is a huge opportunity. Uh, it's a huge opportunity because it's in Egypt. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, it's, so it's finally in Africa, in a zone where it's hot, uh, uh, led by uh, 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 a government that understands the, the need and the urgency of fighting this problem. It's also an, uh, 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 taking place so in that's that's in terms of the place. The time is also auspicious uh, for a bad, you know, as a silver lining of a bad crisis, which is a terribly hot summer we had, and a disaster both in in, in, the, in Europe, uh, in the U.S., and 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 of course, first uh, and foremost, in in Pakistan with the floods that occurred in Pakistan, where we are at a time where people are aware, perhaps more than before, of the urgency of of tackling this problem. And finally, we are at a time where energy is expensive and uh, traditional energies are expensive and therefore there might be uh, a bit more of curiosity uh, for, for uh, uh, understanding how we can live with different energies, but perhaps also uh, with less. Uh, so thank you very much for launching this series and for having me. And I wish all of us a lot of luck in the run up to uh, COP27. Thank you very much, Professor Lutzo, very clear from the very uh, general statement of the main issues of the problem to very concrete examples of opportunities uh, uh, with, with the clear evidence. So thank you very much. Uh, um, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Moheldin, 
uh, Egypt's UN uh, climate change high-level champion, UN uh, special envoy for SDG finance. Um, Professor uh, Duflo mentioned the political uh, problem from hell. Uh, you're a champion of multilateralism and how multilateralism can be, um, you know, the best instrument to address uh, global problems. So we would like to hear uh, your reaction. The floor is yours. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Louis Felipe, for the introduction, for this uh, excellent partnership that we have with you and uh, your team in conducting this uh, uh, series um, of discussion to enlighten the policymakers. It's great um, to have the uh, formidable economist uh, whom we owe a great deal of uh, knowledge of understanding, not just of the problems, but how interventions can, could be maximized. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Duflo, for uh, your um, uh, excellent presentation. You touched upon uh, many aspects um, that of great relevance to uh, a summit that claims from the very beginning it should be a solution summit and an implementation um, uh, summit. And uh, on what you mentioned, perhaps let me build on uh, what uh, Philippe just mentioned now on uh, a political uh, problem uh, from hell and how can we provide perhaps economic uh, solutions from heaven uh, with, with what with what you shared with us um, at at the very end, um, and it's all about uh, finance. And uh, you propose that mechanism um, of finance that could really go beyond the one the famous 100 billion, as you rightly mentioned, never been fulfilled. And there is a debate whether it is 80 percent fulfilled or 20 percent, based on which report we are, you are reading. Um, uh, but anyways, when it comes to to climate finance, it seems, um, and it's good that you put those two examples at the end, one on mitigation and the other on uh, adaptation. It seems that the private sector in partnership with the government found its way and the business case for more solutions when it comes to decarbonization and mitigation. Less so when it comes to um, adaptation. And it seems still that even the example that you mentioned and based on a very good discussion that you had, we had yesterday with uh, our good uh, colleague from the bank, uh, Stefan Alligate, about the uh, adaptation imperative that still the private sector needs to do more. Getting uh, an update from a report uh, from the Global Center uh, of Adaptation, um, um, uh, figures from Africa saying $11.4 billion had been spent on adaptation, of which 3% our private sector. As an optimist, I say, hey, 3%, this could be a $400 million that could be scaled up. But then we, when we dig deep, it's this private sector is not really the typical private sector, the profit maximizers and the risk takers, mainly foundations and institutions. So where exactly you can really see that mechanism working with more reliance on different, perhaps, political economy dynamics? The problem has been with us. The science has proven it, as you mentioned. But then when we are going to be seeing the triggers to have more efforts by the private sector mitigation and to provide more solution in the adaptation front, where, where we suffer more, especially in countries relying more in rural um, activities, agriculture, and food production that being impacted uh, the most. Where, where exactly you can see the possible intervention from the policy side, perhaps at a local level or national level, or internationally. Well, I think one one uh, one of the reasons why we see uh, why we don't see the, the private sector investing in adaptation uh, at all, or mostly almost not at all, uh, is that uh, it, it it's really very hard to make the case that it's going to pay for itself for someone. <laughs> it's paying for itself in terms of social welfare. But uh, it is not clear you can bring that money back to your investors in any ways. Or it is also difficult to make up a story for why you are making the money back to your investor. Uh, so that's, I think that's the, the reason why um, you, you won't find um, a, a, a very large amount of uh, unsubsidized, non-philanthropic private in investment in adaptation 
uh, solutions and where it needs to come from. It is basically to remedy uh, um, an externality that have been that has been imposed by the rest of the world on on the poor, and this uh, we need public funding for that. Uh, the implementation, of course, can be private. So it can well, adaptation solutions could well become investment opportunity if someone's ready to pay for it. In the same way that you have private schools that are financed by, uh, by, by vouchers. But uh, the, the, the funding fundamentally in a large part will have to be, uh, will have to be public. Uh, the, the value is going to be in the form of social returns of uh, you know increased welfare for for the poorest populations one point professor duflo and, and mr mohaldin if i may um there are two you know in the wdr 2017 the world development report of the bank we talk about quality of institutions and two of them is the capacity to sustain agreements over time and professor duflo referred to commitment what are the commitment devices we have and and particularly when we have to commit to a long-term Perspective. The other is the capacity to induce aligned behavior, which is coordination. Here, these two elements are fundamental, and the question is whether we have the institutional instruments to promote those two, particularly in the case, as was mentioned, in which there might be important trade-offs, but at least in the short run. Uh, so to what extent is this um, idea that the private sector, uh, Mr. Moylin, can be part of the solution, which we, do, we know there is a huge increase in, in uh, sustainable finance instruments. Uh, but to what extent is that based on the idea of a win-win uh, when, when we have serious trade-offs is more an issue of the, of the public sector, just to, just to leave the question there. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I build on that, perhaps on the yes. issue of the magnitude of contribution to emissions? You mentioned India, and I was just in India last week. And we had this discussion with many of the thought leaders, with government as well. They are very much fond of this idea of a holistic approach when it comes to climate action. Perhaps in line very much with what you just uh, described to us, that you cannot just talk about climate and forgetting the impact on the poor. Solutions could come from income distribution. This may really require um, some better attention to that holistic approach. Here, this is the series that's trying to identify the synergies and the possible trade-offs between climate action and the SDGs action or the overall action towards dealing, for instance, specifically with eliminating um, extreme poverty. Where are you seeing interventions uh, meeting some areas of tension and push back? Um, and where do you see the synergies that could be um, maximized? And then perhaps I can go back to this uh, comment made uh, uh, earlier on uh, the behavioral change and what could be required. So where are the trade-offs and synergies between climate and, and development? And, and do you see a value of a holistic approach or not? Well, India is in a very, uh, very peculiar position because uh, uh, because it's so large. So it's and it's getting richer and it has rich citizens that uh, are responsible for a fair share of emissions. And and therefore it, it can be considered itself to be on both sides of the problem. On the one hand, it's suffering from the warming that's already happening and that creates uh, disasters in, in, in India already. And on the other hand, it's uh, still a poor and growing economy that feels it owes a lot to its citizens and would like to, to see them uh, grow and consume as much as possible. And you can see that in India, depending on the moment, uh, there is more or less uh, um, uh, willingness to uh, to take on board the fact that they are a, a, a major player in what's going to happen to climate in the future and, and, and also a major uh, are going to receive the, the are going to be on the receiving end of the impact as well uh, because it's already hot because it has a monsoon and, and because some places in India are already disappearing and so that's kind of a, 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 a um, pretty remarkable position. 
and it's also in a in a situation where not all of the investments are sunk in so it has some possibilities to uh, move uh, uh, you know to leapfrog the bad technology to go straight to the good technology the problem is that all of that it takes either money or time uh, and uh, meaning either you're going to progress a little slower towards uh, you know the goal of electrifying everyone or 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 to uh, or um, you know, to to provide good mobility to everyone or so on or more or money and 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 that's where i think uh, often these trade offs are temporary and they could be solved with enough resources an example that was a huge miss opportunity that was a few year, a few years ago already is the kigali agreement on air conditioning unit where uh, india and china successfully argued that they could keep the bad air conditioning unit keep installing them out till 2024 which uh, is just <laughs> which was just a matter of money because if they had been given enough money to retire all of this and then create a new company that would create the new con air conditioning unit they would have been able nothing prevented them to transition faster uh, and uh, now it, so it appears like a trade-off, which is, well, it's already hot here, so we need to install very quickly cheap air conditioning units. Um, trade-off, which I think led to a disastrous choice, because now all of these units are going to be with us till, uh, till you know, for, for years and years and years and generate emissions that could entirely have been avoided. But there was no real trade-off, because it was just a question of someone coming up and saying, look, it's okay, we are just going to help you manage this transition. So in many cases, the, the trade-off are only there because we are looking for things that are financially sustainable in the instant. But, you know, we have the ability to, to, to finance poorer countries to take different paths, and, uh, and we should. The other trade-off, which again is, uh, is well illustrated by the situation of India, is, is and it uh, could again be uh, said in the in, uh, illustrated by the air conditioning is in general india saying look i cannot afford not to become rich quickly because nobody is helping us for adaptation what i'm seeing looking over the world is that the countries that are that are adapting the best to climate change are the countries that have that have that have resources that are wealthy enough so given that nobody is there to help us, it's not really a choice for me uh, to not become rich fast in order to, in order to, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to protect my citizens. So it's not just a matter of, oh, you did this in the past, so we are now going to do it. At this moment, it can be, it's, it could be, it's, it's like short-run survival versus what's going to happen in the longer run. And again, it could be, alleviated if we had a real and solid and credible commitment that these adaptation efforts are going to be supported. So from the point of view of the planet, more financing of adaptation is actually going to lift off a lot of these trade-offs. And we don't really hear that. The developing countries, that's what they are mostly concerned about, is are they going to survive the next drought? Whereas the rich countries are thinking about, oh, we know, you know, can we try and uh, give you a path to growth that is a little bit more energy friendly and so on, which is also interesting. But there is a, uh, there is an, a more urgent need that comes in the way of, of being willing to do that. Right. OK. Just between brackets, before I get into um, uh, my final question, and perhaps if we have time, there could be one Egypt specific question as well. But, well, India and China are being taken seriously for the reason that you just mentioned. Africa with very limited emissions, 3%, could be just a margin of error of some of the large emitters today. So perhaps a good argument going forward that if we leave matters to their own courses of action in Africa, which is very much ambitious to urbanize, to grow, to develop, to industrialize, those 3% that we are celebrating at a cost of poverty and a cost of inequality, at a cost of deprivation of more than 600 million people without electricity, this story will not be the same in a few years because everybody now is going to be thinking. It's like the debate that we're seeing now with the African Union. We have natural gas, we have fossil fuel. Let's burn that and get what we want. Um, 
So this kind of, because you talked about behavioral change, and this is not just within a household level or within a country level, but perhaps it could be helpful in international relations. Don't take these matters as given or for granted. Unless we have, which it comes to my question, both three things that I managed to get from your excellent presentation, change in behavior, change of acquiring technology and adapting it, and change of finance, matters will not really be achieving at all the Paris Agreement with the page that we're at. And actually, there could be new polluters, new emitters that you cannot control as such with this kind of passive behavior. What do you think about that? I, I could not agree more. I think you're absolutely right. And I think what we are seeing playing out with India, with India now, we are going to see in some sense hopefully see happening with Africa in the future. I'm saying hopefully in, in, in curly brackets because, you know, this would, this would be terrible to have to deal with another large source of emission. But on the other hand, it would be uh, the consequences of Africa becoming uh, richer. So how do we avoid that? Well, you consider now what it would take to decarbonize, decarbonize the U.S. We would need to basically... <laughs> put everything out in the trash and then do it again, which eventually is probably going to get done in over some long periods of time. But it's like um, um, having built the wrong pipes and the wrong tubes and everything needs to be redone from scratch in Africa because the, the, not all the infrastructure is in place. We have an opportunity to do this right. And so it's going to be much cheaper than for the world to first install things the wrong way and then dismantle them progressively. So that's a huge opportunity for the world. But again, take, you know, is Africa, look at the current uh, uh, financial situation today. Is an African country, uh, like Nigeria, is Nigeria going to be willing to borrow from, say, China in order to install some brand new uh, hydroelectric infrastructure when they are not sure what happens if at some point there is a crisis and they can't reimburse and China refuses to be in an IMF program. So unless we have a commitment that is not in the form of a loan that is potentially lending countries on a terrible path, a financial path, countries are not going to do, uh, uh, are not going to be willing to do something that's potentially more expensive and longer uh, because they have no reason to trust us, us being the international community, richer countries, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, in international institutions as well. So that's why we need commitments that are firm and that are attached with a funding mechanism. Uh, and then only you can uh, uh, reinstate the trust, trust that is needed uh, for citizens vis-à-vis their governments, trust that is needed for uh, uh, developing countries' government, uh, thinking about the rest of the international community and trust, which for good reasons is in very short supply at the moment. Yeah, Professor Flo, Dr. Mohelini, if I may, as we, yeah, approach, as we approach the end of the conversation, I would like to ask you a question that is uh, coming from our colleagues. And uh, it's, it's, you know, in a way it's, it's there in the, in the discussion, but we would like more specificity in terms of the World Bank. What do you think, two or three things that you think the, the World Bank can do different in terms of climate action and climate interventions? I know if you want to start, uh, Dr. Mohezin. I refer to the professor first, and then I can say a couple of things and expectations from the champion. Professor as well. Uh, I don't know if, I, if I'm... Uh, um... Uh, knowledgeable enough about what the World Bank is already doing and what are the mechanisms in its, in its, uh, under its control to, to fully do, do justice to, to this question. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, uh, and I, I know people are keenly aware of that, is to uh, have a public presence <laughs> in uh, uh, recognizing the importance of climate change and, uh, and the responsibility of the of international institution, including the World Bank, in dealing with it. Uh, the World Bank is also a knowledge bank, and uh, just uh, sharing uh, the knowledge and sharing the, the advocacy is uh, um, uh, given the role of the bank, uh, 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 both in the international community and in each country, would be 
is is essential so to, to have well, like one one common language that is uh, uh, that is forceful on these issues and that puts the the welfare of the poorest people at the center uh, is uh, would be a, a, a good thing the, the, the second thing uh, is um, to contribute to establishing evidence uh, again no magic bullet in climate change uh, many many silver pellets and we don't have enough uh, as the minister said in some sense in climate we are a bit behind the fight against poverty generally other facets of the fight against poverty in having many things in our toolkits the world bank has played a central critic and uh, an extraordinarily valuable role in helping government build their toolkit to, to fight poverty, working, for example, on conditional cash transfer, on health policy, and so on. There is, I think, margin to do much more uh, to help countries uh, develop uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, tools that are uh, available to each countries. So that those are the, besides the, the usual, you know, funding, yeah. own negotiation and grants what? that we can what? think about. What, 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 yeah, um, I, I'm happy to step in on that and perhaps building on two things that uh, Professor Duffer is doing. One, and the knowledge leader, and other as leading practice in Egypt back home. They have a very interesting um, uh, project, uh, uh, JPL in Egypt, on social protection, linking it to climate. So one area that could be scaled up, a partnership perhaps, between the World Bank, other MDBs, with the good work that's starting um, evidence-based approach with JPL and the beneficiaries of ministries and the civil society in Egypt. That's an, and that could be a good thing. But let me just, living in, in the World Bank for 10 years and based on what uh, Professor Duffler mentioned now, it's the issue on the, 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 the change in behavior, finance and technology. The World Bank through knowledge sharing could really play an important role in that. And the finance in particular, one of the best vehicles, the most efficient in a world that is suffering when it comes to finance, from, uh, for, for finance to be insufficient, inefficient, and unfair as well because of the cost of borrowing, one of the best mechanisms in existence today is IDA. And that needs really more support. And I would say that IDA terms shouldn't be just limited to either beneficiaries, the low income countries. They could be extended to low middle income countries and they could be extended to other institutions, not just the World Bank. So you go to regional development banks or to the Green Climate Fund, you say, well, I need either based finance. This means swift finance coming with technical assistance with grace period of paying back for seven, 10 years and more and the cost of borrowing that is very limited. So that could really be a good solution for this kind of political problem from hell that Professor Duffley mentioned. You get an economic finance solutions on that based on the experience. Are we brave enough to extend either terms to low middle income countries as we did in the past in Iraq, which was middle income, as we did to Jordan and Lebanon when they dealt with Syrian refugees, as we dealt in Latin America because of the crisis there as well. A foot for thought, basically, because we don't, sometimes we are fond of creating new mechanisms while some existing mechanisms could really be functioning fast. They will not take many years to be established and we can benefit from the knowledge of these institutions that host them. Uh, definitely it has been a fascinating discussion with you, uh, Professor Diflu. Look forward uh, to, to welcome you in Egypt. You describe Egypt properly as an African, as an Arab, as a Mediterranean, as a middle income country that has a number of the poor and extremely poor that are now priority uh, for our policies on, in, in the country to deal with their challenges through evidence-based solutions. And we hope that climate action could be part of these solutions going forward. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Duflo. It has been a privilege to hear your presentation and to have this conversation. Dr. Mohaldin, thank you very much. As I said, you're a champion of multilateralism. So uh, we are all expecting the COP27 to to be a great opportunity for the international community. So, uh, Minister Rani Al-Mashal, thank you very much for partnering with the World Bank on the road to COP27. Uh, uh, myself, Luis Felipe Lopez-Calva, uh, Poverty and Equity Global Director, I thank you all for joining this uh, conversation, and we really expect you to join the series of uh, conversations that we will have in the future. Uh, 
So thank you again, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.